Hi, uh, welcome to London Berlin. Uh, next week, we will have Anand Rao, Tadipatri, and Siddhartha Gatil talking about Kaplansky units conjecture. And today, we are very happy to have Alex Vers, who's going to speak about solving Diophantine equations via the classroom. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Maria. And uh, well, Kevin, for the invitation. And yeah, sorry about the technical issues. Hopefully, they should all be, will be solved now. Uh, just shout if there's any issues. I think I can hear you from here. So uh yes we should be all sorted now anyway so yeah the, the project i'm going to talk about is some joint work with anaban and sandadarman and nirvana coppola uh so the four of us at the time were at the vu on the left and now i'm at king's so that's why there's two two things there and uh the project is about uh solving daffanton equations so i figured i would start with uh what are daffanton equations and i i well assume nothing of the audience so uh i decided to give a little visual demo so this is a two by two by two uh, block of, of cubes, right? And if you rearrange them, you almost get a three by three by three square, except you're missing one, okay? So it's just sort of the thing that a child might do, rearranging uh, sort of cubes and getting squares and kind of wondering uh, what's possible, you know? Uh, is this the only time this happens? Are there many times this happens? Uh, and you could consider this sort of problem the sort of problem that the people who study Diophantine equations are interested in. Of course, they're interested in many more things, but this is sort of a, the genesis of the subject is, you know, sort of whole numbers, right? That's, that's, that's we're counting things and sort of what you can do with sort of multiplication and addition. So removing things, you know, making squares, making cubes out of things, making other sort of uh, objects. And of course, we, we don't really study these things by, by playing around with cubes. Uh, what we do is we use equations. And well, this project, I tried to visualize the output of this project on the right uh, with the same sort of uh, visualization. And of course, uh, it's completely uh, impossible to see what's happening. So I'll just tell you what that uh, other animation was showing was a solution to the following equation. So a square, uh, which is a cube with uh, 13 uh, points removed. So some square number is some cube number uh, minus 13. And so this is maybe uh, has no solutions, maybe it has some solutions. In fact, it has one. Uh, so this uh, solution is actually x is 17 and y is 70. Okay, so, so these sort of things have been studied for a long, long time. I'm sure uh, Greek mathematicians also uh, liked problems like this. Uh, but this particular equation is the sort of thing that, that really only got sort of resolved in the 20th century. So unfortunately, we're not at the 21st century yet. Uh, at least not in this area, but we wanted to kind of push forward in this kind of uh, area of sort of number theory and arithmetic geometry and kind of start to resolve some sort of harder equations that you can't do with uh, tools that were known, say, 200 years ago or 300 years ago. So this is a block of lean code here, right? Uh, so in the London Learning Lean Seminar, uh, well, I think maybe we're the only people in London, but hopefully everyone knows lean. So so this is well, hopefully readable, even if you don't know lean. It's a very simple statement. That's why we like them. And uh, we can see here that we have two solutions because y could also be negative. And the proof is, of course, rather involved. And we do many other things in the project. But this is sort of maybe, you could say, the hardest example that we do in this project. Uh, so yeah, these are known as Diophantine integrations. And, and really, it's a, it's a very open area of research still um, to this day. I mean, so here's a very simple equation. x squared plus y cubed is set to the fifth power. And uh, as far as I know, that's, that's unresolved. So it, there's a kind of a continuum uh, of things which are kind of trivial or medium hard, and then, well, currently unknown. And we are kind of hopefully in sort of the medium hard stage rather than the trivial stage. Uh, in general, this is an undecidable problem. So of course, that means there's no algorithm we can give that, that sort of will do this for us. So any proof we give um, somehow won't just be execute this code. Uh, and here's the answer in general. In this particular case, it might be. And there's sort of like a, a whole zoo of different equations and techniques out there. And sort of one of the reasons we quite enjoy formalizing this project is, is kind of to put a bit more kind of structure and organization, right? You've come up with some method. Uh, and you want to know which equations it works on, uh, one of the nice things about formalizing is kind of uh, relaxing assumptions and kind of pushing uh, known methods to, to sort of new equations by sort of copy pasting the code and seeing where it breaks. And uh, well, that's sort of one thing we hopefully would get to one day, but for now we just do a couple of equations. Uh, so yeah, 
we, we form a sort of a technique uh, using uh, number fields in the class group, which I'll define later. Uh, and it's about 6,000 lines of lean code. Uh, and so uh, we also have a little XKCD about number theorists uh, not having any friends, uh, just to, to make everyone laugh. But the audience is rather small here, so not an audible laugh, unfortunately. Okay, so let's get into sort of the, the classical methods first. I mean, uh, half my time is meant to be explaining the mathematics and half the time is meant to be explaining lean. So let's start with the, the kind of the, the easy methods, so to speak, for solving Diophant integrations. So these are things which are either ancient, maybe known to the Greeks, or at least known to Euler and Gauss and sort of, you know, maybe sort of more rigorously done by, by Euler and Gauss. Uh, and the first of these is, is congruences, right? So here's a, an equation which looks somewhat similar to y squared is x cubed minus 13, except I put a two and a four in front of the y and the x. And what happens in that case is that we have no integer solutions. Because in this example, we can see if x and y are integers, uh, the left-hand side is even, no matter what y is, and the right-hand side is odd, no matter what x is, because uh, we've subtracted 13. So this is kind of a basic technique, but we'll see that actually this technique or these sort of techniques, are, they're the sort of the bread and butter of Diophantin equations. And they're the things that you need even along the way for when you're resolving more, more complicated equations. So congruences obviously could take a more general form. Instead of talking about even and odd, we could talk about remainders, modulo, primes, other than two. Uh, and of course, that's also very, very useful. Uh, the second technique uh, that's kind of classical is, is descent, uh, which you could also say goes back to the Greeks, but was also sort of used a lot by Fama. And you may know this from, you know, showing that two is not, uh, uh, what is it? No, sorry, the square root of two. Yeah, <laughs> showing that the square root of two is irrational, right? Here you're trying to solve y squared is two x squared. And you kind of say, well, if there was a solution, then actually y would have to be even. Oh, and that would make x even. And so you could construct a smaller solution. So that kind of shows that zero, zero is the only solution to this equation. Of course, that doesn't uh, prove that, that two is, uh, sorry, the square root of two is rational, uh, but it, it's kind of this infinite descent method where given any integer solution, you could make a smaller one that just can't happen in the integers and gives a contradiction. So this is kind of useful, you know, often for showing that sort of zero is the only solution to, to some equation um, or, or something like that. And the final technique is a bit harder. This is something you might see in a kind of a, an actual first course on, on algebraic number theory or something like that uh, is quadratic reciprocity. And this is really, uh, well, due to Gauss, uh, written down around 200 years ago. And this is a little bit harder, uh, but it, it, it relates uh, numbers, well, so let's just say primes being squares modular other primes, so squares in the ring, uh, integers mod the second prime, uh, to the same problem, but with the the role of the two prime swapped. So this is a way to kind of play off information about uh, being squares plot different primes against each other. And you can often prove sort of non-solvability of equations uh, of a similar form in this way. So here it's kind of maybe in principle uh, an even harder equation because there's an x to the four instead of an x to the three. Um, but here is sort of quadratic reciprocity. I'm not gonna say the proof out loud, but quadratic reciprocity gives a proof that this equation is insoluble. Sorry, the audience size almost doubled in an instant. Okay, so, so people have uh, used these techniques before uh, in formalization, right? They've formalized these techniques and they've proven interesting results using them. Uh, formally, of course, these results are very off. So the first one I think is sometimes known as Fermat's Christmas theorem because he wrote it in a letter to someone that was dated uh, the 25th of December. It's kind of funny to think of uh, Fermat working hard with all the presents waiting by the tree, but ignoring them. Uh, but this says that the equation x squared plus y squared equals p has a solution for all primes p that are 1, 1, 4. And so this was done, uh, you know, sort of formally almost 20 years ago in, in the proof system Koch, uh, which is very similar to Lean, of course. Uh, and it uses uh, sort of, yeah, the, the sort of techniques on the previous page, I should say. Uh, sort of one year later, people did sort of the, the n equals four case of uh, the Fermat equation, x to the four plus y to the four is z to the four, pro proving that it has no non-zero solutions. Uh, also in Koch, that's uh, De La Haya and Mayero. Uh, and they also kind of solve some, some other kind of classical problems in the, in, in the field. Uh, I forget what this, this second one is. It's something to do with uh, triangles, right? So 
x squared plus y squared equals z squared is uh, sort of the equation that gives you Pythagorean triples, uh, which you can think of as giving you sides of a triangle. And then this is some kind of extra condition. I think, I guess it's saying that the, the area of a triangle can't be a square, right? I guess that's what this is saying. So yeah, they did that using sort of these techniques again. Ah, and it's off the edge of the page. Oh, that's very unfortunate. Hmm. Maybe I'll look on my other laptop at what it says, and I can read it out. OK, but uh, so this is sort of a similar thing to Fermat's Christmas, Christmas theorem, except in Isabel now. So that this was a master's thesis somewhere in the Netherlands. Um, and so someone uh, did this sort of more advanced version of the, the Fermat's Christmas theorem with a 3 in front of the y squared. And they also did the n equals 3 case of uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, also in Isabel. So, right, this thing just has no solutions. All right, that's what Fermat conjectured that was sort of known for, for a long time, only for uh, small exponents. So, the first thing I want to do is try to explain why uh, y squared equals x cubed minus 13 is suddenly a little bit harder. Um, you know, why does, you know, some people kind of did similar things sort of 15 or 20 years ago in Isabel and Koch and things like that. And I want to kind of give some justification for sort of maybe why uh, sort of the next step in of doing uh, more Diophantine equations wasn't really taken until now. And of course, people have done other things since then. Uh, but, but why is this harder? Uh, so if you think of Diophantine equations in two variables, uh, which many of the previous ones are, uh, geometrically, they define curves. You've got two variables. You've got one equation. You could, you could plot that, and you could imagine it as a set of uh, points in a plane, and you're looking for you know, which of the points on the curve have integer coordinates. And in general, resolving a problem like this, uh, the genus is the important number. And the genus of a curve, I, I won't define it, but if you know some topology, it's essentially the sort of number of holes when you plot it as a, as a complex surface. Uh, this increases essentially with the degree of the equation, okay? Being a bit hazy here, but Hopefully you get the idea. So you know, we've, if we change something with x squared into x cubed, uh, the genus might go up, and the equation might get kind of more difficult to resolve in, in some technical sense. Um, and as soon as the genus is at least one, we have a finite set of integral points, which is nice. It means that you know the answer that we're looking for, the set of solutions to the equation, uh, could in principle be written down in a list. Uh, and in fact, the curve we're looking at, y squared equals x cubed minus 13, is sort of the prototypical example of a, an elliptic curve, right? It's a curve of genus one. And the thing that makes these interesting is that in many cases, they have finitely many rational solutions. Uh, but in many cases, they have infinitely many rational solutions. In fact, you'd expect to, to flip a coin and uh, see, see whether they have finitely many or infinitely many set of rational solutions. And so this curve, y squared equals x cubed minus 13, actually has infinitely many rational solutions. So I plotted it at the bottom there, and maybe you can see in very tiny, there's some red points on the curve. Those are sort of rational solutions. And the blue point, and maybe you can see the cursor is right there. Uh, that's this point, uh, 1770, right? Uh, and so when you've got infinitely many rational solutions, the first thing that does is it means that sort of, you can't just find all the rational solutions in order to find all the integral ones, as sort of a subset of that. Uh, it also means that things like congruences uh, might not help you as much as before because congruence is kind of, you know, if you've got rational solutions, then you'll probably get many solutions modulo different primes, uh, sort of just because if you reduce a rational number mod modulo a prime, you'll, you'll get some, some random point. And so you can't really rule out solutions in that way. And the other thing which makes this harder is that, of course, it, it does have this non trivial integral point. So in some sense, it's maybe easier to rule things out. And then when you actually have a point, um, yeah, you, you, you have to do something a bit more general than just sort of, you know, getting a proof by contradiction or a bit more sophisticated, let's say. Uh, so we chose this example as it was kind of the first example we could not really think of a way to cheat or, or a way to kind of, you know, give a, an easier proof. Some kind of similar equations uh, like this, uh, you can kind of give simpler proofs uh, using some of the more basic techniques, but this one, we, we don't know of one anyway. Maybe one exists, who knows? Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little about the history. I just really like this. When we were looking at this project, I was like looking up a bit about Mordell. So Mordell was from like Philadelphia. So Mordell is the first person who first kind of started studying, maybe not the first one, but one of the, the early pioneers in the study of equations like this. 
And the proof that we give is basically uh, something that Mordell wrote down about 100 years ago. And so he was somehow a, a high school student in Philadelphia who, I don't know, traveled on a boat uh, to Cambridge and then, you know, beat all these Englishmen in a in the entrance exams, coming number one out of 250. And the local newspaper was very proud that uh, that he had gone to the UK and, uh, you know, shown us his boss. Uh, and there are some other funny quotes in here about him standing at a blackboard for 48 hours. I don't know if that was contiguous or not, but he sounds like quite a character. Um, but he studied these questions originally, and the proof we gave is essentially due to him. Uh, so, yeah, maybe without further ado, let's go into it. So this is sort of the argument. You write down the equation, x squared is y cubed minus 13, and you move the minus 13 to the left-hand side, and you factor it. You factor it over, you could say over the complex numbers, but you could also consider this as a factorization over a ring where you take the integers and you simply add one extra element, which is a square root of minus 13. Uh, so you've kind of not really added too much to the integers. You don't have you know, the whole complex numbers. You just have kind of uh, one extra thing that you've thrown in there. And then sort of in that ring, you could check that the two things on the left-hand side of this factorization were co-prime. And then sort of inspired by the way things work with the integers, you might think, well, if the product of two co-prime things is a cube, then maybe both those things are cubes, okay? And well, if that was true, uh, we would be able to conclude the proof, right? So, so here's how it would go. You would say, okay, for example, if y plus the square root of minus 13 was a cube in this ring, right? It was a cube of some a plus b uh, root negative 13. Uh, you could just write out what, what happens when you cube this element, right? You get some kind of thing, three times 13 here. Uh, you do some little bit of algebra, some manipulations, to reduce it to this form, and you see an a factors out here on the on the the sort of the the integer term, and a b factors out there on sort of the the imaginary quadratic term, and so if this thing here was to equal y plus uh, root negative thirteen, well, that would mean that b times this quadratic uh, was equal to one, and that would mean that b had to be plus or minus one. Okay, so now we're only in integers; we're just working the integers, and b are simply integers. And so if b is plus or minus one, well, you could you know, follow the algebra through. Well, what would that mean for a? Um, you, you do a little bit of you know, fairly straightforward manipulations, and you discover that you know, 3a squared minus 13 has to be plus or minus one. And then that means that a has to be plus or minus two, and b has to be minus one. And then you go and you substitute those back in, and you find out what y is. And then once you know y, then of course you square it, you add 13, you get some, some cube, which is the cube of x. So following this through, once again, you can't see the, the very bottom of the slide, but it simply says the thing that the lean code said on the first slide, which was that uh, x is 17 and y is 70. OK, are there, are there any questions so far? Hmm. Cool. Please ask questions, by the way. I mean, we have loads of time, so it's, it's really no bother. LOL on the first line. Oh, the LOL was lines of lean code. So I was at a conference where someone wrote LOI for like lines of Isabel, and I thought LOL would be would be very funny for lines of lean code, but it makes less sense out of context. I'm sorry. What's the class number of Q root minus thirteen? That's my question. We will get to that. It is class number two. Yes, but we will we will cover the class number in, in great detail starting now. Uh, so in the integers, right, it's almost true that uh, if you have a, a product of two program things being an nth power, uh, then each of those things is an nth power. Uh, sort of the only thing which makes this not exactly true as stated is the presence of plus or minus one. So for example, if I take minus four times minus nine, that's 36, which is six squared, but minus four and minus nine aren't literally squares, but they're plus or minus a square. So we're going to kind of like gloss over this issue. Um, in general, this is the issue of the unit group showing up, um, but we're going to kind of ignore that for the most part. But but just to say this is not going to be literally true, um, but this is kind of what inspires the proof. And we want to know when this holds in sort of more general uh, rings, and in particular in, in number rings or number fields. So number fields are the sort of things you get when you do a factorization like the thing on the previous slide where you add some sort of algebraic numbers uh, to the integers, 
or, or to the rational numbers. And that's the sort of context we're going to be working in. And so in this sort of ring, uh, we have some issues. So here is an example in the ring, uh, z adjoin root negative 13. We've got 6 plus root negative 13 times by 2 minus 3 root negative 13. And that's some, some thing which happens to be a square. Right, the square of some other number, 8 minus root negative 13, all squared. And in fact, these two things on the left-hand side are co-prime, uh, but neither of them is a square in z root negative 13, and neither of them is the negative of a square even, or any other unit. I mean, those are the only units. Um, so this kind of property uh, of co-prime things factoring only into, into powers when their they're product, sorry, the power factoring only into co-primers, which are themselves powers, uh, breaks. Kind of famously, uh, this kind of spurred on the whole field of number theory. Uh, and yes, we, we would like to know, have a condition for precisely when it breaks and, and how it breaks. So clearly there's something weird about two here that makes this break, but, but maybe it still works for three. We'd love it to still work for three. Okay, so this is the problem, right? Uh, say for cubes or for any integer n. And the, the key concept that controls you know, whether we can resolve this problem or not is known as the class group or the ideal class group. So to give us sort of a simple way of defining it, if you have, uh, let's say, the ring of integers of a number field, um, so just imagine a ring uh, like the ones you've been talking about so far, uh, and you take the set of non-zero ideals of that and you quotient it by some, some sort of equivalence relation, which basically says that there is a, a pair of elements which when multiplied by uh, sort of, yeah, the, the ideals. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe this is a bit weird way of writing it. The ideal should become equal. So I should say I um, is equivalent to J if and only if there exists some X and Y such that X times I equals Y times J. Yeah, a little bit of a typo there. Um, so this actually forms a group uh, under the multiplication of ideals, given two ideals, you can multiply them. Um, and we call the elements of this group ideal classes. And in fact, it's a, uh, well, a finite abelian group. And sort of, well, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, the interesting thing about this group is sort of that every principal ideal is sort of clearly equivalent to the, the sort of the trivial ideal, the ideal generated by one. And that's a, an if and only if. So an ideal is in the same ideal class as one, if and only if it's principal. And uh, the kind of upshot is that we have unique factorization into prime ideals. So here we had a kind of a failure of unique factorization of elements. Here we had two irreducible elements uh, whose product was actually another two irreducible elements. Um, but the, you know, it, yeah, that, that's sort of a failure of unique factorization. Um, and so the sort of resolution of this is to uniquely factor not into elements, but into prime ideals. In this, uh, in this ring. And so on the level of ideals, our previous example, uh, sort of what basically happens is that this thing on the left-hand side as an ideal now, so we take the ideal generated by this element is the square of this ideal, or is, yeah, yeah. The ideal generated by this is the square of this ideal, where we've just thrown a seven in there. Uh, this ideal here on the right is the square of this other ideal where you've thrown 11 in there. And uh, that, uh, thing on the right here is still, um, yeah, it's, yeah, we get unique factorization. So I mean, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side and all of these things are prime ideals. And so that sort of explains what went wrong previously was that really we shouldn't have factored into elements, we should have factored into ideals. And then we would have had a square factoring only into squares. And the, the kind of the key point here is that this ideal here is not principal. There's no single element that generates this ideal. Um, it's a non-trivial element class group. In fact, these two things lie in the same class in the class group. And that I mean, kind of answers Kevin's question. It's the class group is uh, the cyclic group of order two in this case. So the upshot of this sort of thing is that there is a finite abelian group called the class group attached to every number field K. And if the order of the class group is co-prime to some integer N, then 
okay, there's some problem with units. So I'll just write there exists a couple of units U and V such that um, R and S co prime equaling T to the N implies R is U times some T1 to the N and S is some V times T2 to the N. So we kind of get this powers only factoring into powers up to units for co prime things. I didn't write co prime here, but R and S should be co prime. So what this means is that there's this thing called the class group that if we can explicitly compute it, right, a finite abelian group, so we can compute it by giving a list of all the elements or a list of all the, the generators, for example, and also the unit group. And we only have to do these things modular nth powers, right, because that's all we really care about. If we know the unit group up to nth powers, we can absorb anything else into here. Um, we can sort of push the previous proof through. Right. By the previous proof, I mean the, the one that Mordell wrote down sort of about factoring uh, yeah, y, y squared plus some d equals x cubed. So uh, what's been done before? Well, the definition of this class group and the finite abelian group structure of it uh, has previously been formalized by Barnum, Darman, Ashmany, and Nuccio, I guess two years ago, or roughly two years ago. And uh, the unit group uh, is fairly easy to calculate, right? In this case, we actually have, the, there's a, a norm, which is x squared plus dy squared, and that can't really equal plus minus one very often, uh, especially not when d is, is more than two or something. So that doesn't have any impact on, uh, on our, our problem, really, so we'll kind of ignore the unit group from now on and, and focus on the class group. So now I kind of want to, I don't know, be a bit philosophical for a moment and talk about this difference between sort of proving general results, especially when formalizing and kind of doing explicit calculation, right? So we've seen already that there was a proof that the class group was finite, but um, in the sort of thing we're doing, we don't just want a proof that it's finite, we want to know the order of the class group because if we don't know the order, we can't check that it's co-prime to three and we can't uh, make the proof work. So knowing it's finite is not enough because you need somehow a proof of finiteness that actually computes the order, or, or you need to separately somehow compute the order, maybe using the same sort of idea. So, so on the left-hand side, I've written some sort of general and conceptual statements. And on the right-hand side, I've written some sort of like more concrete statements. And you should imagine that, yeah, sort of the things on the left are great, but um, you know, so if you want to solve the problems on the right-hand side, you kind of need to do a bit more work. That's that's all I'm really trying to say here. So, you know, knowing that all these equations have finally many solutions um, is nice. Uh, in fact, we don't have a proof of that, say, in lean. Of course, we know that in theory. Um, but if we want to actually sort of calculate the solutions of some specific equation, that takes some more work. Uh, and likewise, knowing that there is a bound on the norm of the generator of an element of a class group um, is great. Tells you that the class groups are all finite. Um, but if you really want to calculate the class group of this specific number field, you really have to come up with a very tight bound here. Well, it, it's up to you. The, the sort of the looser this bound here is on uh, sort of the, yeah, the generators of the class group, uh, the more work you have to do then to, to check the structure of the group, right? If, if I give you a bound of, you know, 10,000, sort of I say some, some statement like, oh, you know, every element of the class group contains the number 10,000, then I have a lot of kind of different different things to check for generators. Maybe 10,000 is easy because maybe it's only two and five, but you know what I mean. If it's bounded by some number less than 10,000, then, then I've got a problem. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm kind of contrasting here, uh, proving something general with proving something that's kind of more calculational. And uh, when you really have to work in a proof system, uh, yeah, your work, you know, kind of, it can be, it can be easier to do kind of computational things sometimes, but it can also be harder sometimes, depending on the, the sort of the style of the calculation involved, right? Um, it's quite easy to do a cache bash on sort of something like, oh, I've got X and Y and they're, they're integers modulo 17. So I'll just go through all 17 squared cases. That can be quite easy in a proof system compared to on paper. Um, but for this sort of thing where you've got sort of generators of class group, we, we don't really have uh, that, that same sort of computational control and, and you really have to spell things out. So in this case, getting a really good bound on generators of the class group is actually the easier way to go for doing a calculation like this, rather than sort of using a loose bound 
and just saying, oh, well, I'll just deal with all the mess later. So, uh, yeah, we kind of, right, list possible generators of the class group and sort of checking their, their order or relations between them. And uh, sort of checking if an ideal is trivial in the class group is somewhat straightforward, though it has some difficulties. If you want to verify that a particular ideal is trivial in the class group, it's fairly easy, right? You just have to come up with a generator somehow. I mean, maybe you know one off the top of your head, or maybe you could, you know, ask a computer algebra system or, uh, you know, somehow write one down and then just give it to a proof assistant and say, okay, now I'm going to give you a proof that um, everything in this ideal is generated by this, this generator I've chosen. So showing things are uh, principle is fairly doable, let's say. It would be nice if it was completely smooth, but it, it's uh, it still requires a bit of manual labor. But uh, showing these are non-principle somehow seems a little bit harder. Uh, in the case we're in, it's kind of okay. In the case we're in, we've got a quadratic field. And so that means there's a, a norm, which is some uh, binary uh, homogeneous uh, quadric, quadratic. Uh, and so if we have an ideal that we want to show as non-principle, we could just check that the, the norm of that ideal uh, cannot be the norm of some element. Okay. And then I guess we have like Hassan Minkowski, which says that like, okay, if this doesn't happen, then this doesn't happen because of some, some local condition at some prime. And so um, we, we can just, you know, quickly do a proof of that just by working out which prime we have to look at. And then just, just checking all the cases of that prime, for example. Okay, so, so th this is kind of, a, I don't know, interesting somewhat mathematical question that came out of this project was sort of, you know, how often does this sort of trick work, right? How often does the Hasse principle give you a good proof of non-principality um, for, for, yeah, for ideals in your in your field? And so I think there's a lot of people studying sort of related questions um, just purely for the, the mathematical interest. Um, yeah, I think people like Rachel Newton and things like that, you know, they're, they're interested in, you know, arithmetic statistics and how often does the Hasse principle fail for things like abelian number fields. So I think there's an interesting link there between uh, sort of what we're doing, which is you know, relatively elementary, but kind of, you know, yeah. Get, getting some some kind of useful methods that we we know are useful because some sort of theoretical uh, arithmetic statistics tells you that they'll be useful 99% of the time. Anyway. So yeah, in this case, I mean, you can clearly see that that um, an ideal of norm two cannot be principal um, because this equation has has no solutions. So. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the normal way of kind of finding generators for the class group uh, involves this theorem of Minkowski, sometimes called, uh, well, Minkowski bound. And it says that every ideal um, class contains an integral ideal of norm not exceeding this bound. And I didn't tell you what all the things were, but this D is a discriminant of the number field, R2 is the number of complex embeddings, and N is the degree of the number field. Uh, and this relies on something called Minkowski's fundamental theorem, which basically gives you a condition on how big you need to take, how big in terms of volume, you need to take a convex symmetric body, such as an oval, until it's forced to contain a non-zero lattice form. Okay, so this is kind of, if you're presenting the proof of the finite so class group, you might present this as the proof, right? Um, and this sort of basic ingredient, the Minkowski's fundamental theorem, has been formalized in sort of Isabel and uh, whole light and things like that, uh, and also in lean. Uh, but there's kind of a bit more work to kind of turn the proof of this theorem into a proof of the first theorem of Minkowski, right? Minkowski bound. Um, so in fact, that's not what we do. We kind of follow the um, the sort of proof of finiteness, of, uh, proof of finiteness of the class group which uses a theorem like this. So I just wrote the lean code. Um, but what this is, is saying is that you have to find a set of denominators such that if every element of your number field is um, close to something which is has denominator di for some di in, in your set of denominators. And by close, I mean it differs from by something of norm less than one. 
Uh, and by having denominator, I mean it's it's an amount of the ring of integers divided by di. Um, then, so if you can find such a set, then every element of the class group contains the product of these di's. Okay, so it's a bit of a mouthful. So I like to visualize it. So this is a set of norm one balls around every element of z adjoint root negative 13 inside of uh, q adjoint root negative 13. And you can see that they do not cover everything. And then you can take the same picture and you can divide it by two and lay it over the top. So that's the, the red stuff on top of the blue stuff. And you can see that we filled in kind of the gaps here between uh, so the blue norm on balls. So now we've kind of divided them by two and we filled in some more, more gaps. We can still, there's still some space that's not covered. And you can do the same thing again and divide by three. And okay, now it's very, very hard to see. Um, but I promise you that there are still some gaps. I don't know if I can even find one, but they exist. Maybe there, maybe there's a gap. I don't know. But if you divide by four and add that as well, uh, you cover the entire ring of integers. Sorry, the entire number field by things with sort of denominator either one, two, three, or four from the ring of integers. Um, and that's where I think here I said every element of the class group contains the integer 12. That's where this 12 comes from, right? It's the, the products. Well, it's the GCD. Here I could have actually written GCD of two, three, and four. Um, so this is kind of a different proof to what you would normally do. Uh, um, we kind of felt that this required less, less background and less kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know in the end whether it really helped us, but we chose to do it this way. Um, and you can kind of see if you know something about, um, you know, number fields being norm Euclidean, there's some kind of relation here, right, between uh, this property and being norm Euclidean, right? If you can do this with the set of denominators equal to one, that's saying that the, your number field is norm Euclidean, right? There exists a Euclidean algorithm where you take the distance function to be the norm. Um, and so this is somehow kind of a, you know, generalized, uh, I, I don't know, a property related to that. And uh, so kind of to give some flavor of the proof then, what you have to do is to argue that you can, you know, find uh, an element Sorry, one, one, a center of one of these little ovals that's that's close enough to every element of your your of your number field, and so that I mean these ovals are given by some nonlinear right uh, conditions, and so this really becomes kind of a problem of like just verifying uh, a whole bunch of kind of uh, nonlinear arithmetic problems to to check that things are kind of close enough to at least one of these uh, these balls, and we did that in kind of a I would say a, a kind of a manual way again, because we, we have sort of a, a more general theoretical proof, but it, it relies on a bit more um, background material. So, so we didn't bother with that. Um, so for now, this is kind of, maybe you could say the reason why we kind of only got to, to minus 13 is because still sort of steps like this have to be done manually. You have to kind of write down a bit more manually, sort of, okay, how to find sort of the nearest ball to, to any element. Um, of your number field. But hopefully that gives some, some flavor of this. Um, and yeah, doing this then, you, you complete the proof, right? So if you do this, you find that, that every um, ideal uh, class in the class group of Q root negative 13 contains the number 12, and the number of 12 actually uh, factors in, in, that, uh, in that, well, in that uh, ring of integers as, well, two splits, or sorry, it's ramified. Uh, so you get some prime above two and you have that thing to like the eighth power and then three is another. So in fact, one of the other ingredients that goes into this is I think uh, maybe what could Paul Lizzo proving uh, Kumadedekind, uh, Kumadedekind, yeah. Uh, so we can verify that, that the ideal three is another. Uh, verifying that the two is ramified is, is fairly easy because you just get the, the generators and then you can check that the square of that thing is, is the ideal two. Um, but we're using kind of a lot of work of other people uh, kind of setting up the basics of um, algebraic number theory uh, to kind of make this proof through. And then once you know that, you know, sort of every uh, ideal class contains an ideal, 
that divides this explicit product of prime ideals, then of course, you know the generators and then you can just work out, okay, uh, the ideal above two is ramified, it's not principal. And uh, the ideal above three is inert and it is principal. So the, the ideal class group is Z mod two Z. And, and then you complete the proof, right? And then you get this result uh, of model about you know, cubes being close to you know, differing by 13 from squares. Um, so kind of inspired by what we did, we also tried to kind of think about ways to make proofs like this easier in future or ways we could have made our own proof easier in future. So the last couple of slides are about uh, sort of more general things um, that we think would be helpful when doing sort of similar proofs. And we kind of sketch, well, not even sketch, we give some prototypes even for kind of some, some helpers that we hope will you know, be useful when doing proofs like this in future improved systems. Um, so one thing we do is we do a lot of calculations in rings like Zia join root negative 30. And the way we represent this ring is actually just as a pair of integers, um, which might sound like a, <laughs> like a tautology to you. Uh, but of course, there are, there are many ways to, to represent a ring like this in a proof system. So one way might be to say, oh, you uh, take the polynomial ring and you quotient by the ideal containing x squared plus 13. And if you do that, uh, you know, the way your proofs go is quite different to if you just take a model for this ring, which is just a pair of integers. Right? They're, they're equivalent, they're isomorphic, they're isomorphic in rings, uh, assuming you put the right ring structure on both sides. Uh, and they both kind of represent the same object mathematically, but their behavior is very different. So one thing, for example, that's kind of, um, yeah, obvious or sort of like definitionally true when you, when you take uh, definitions of pair of integers is that the mul multiplication map is sort of defined uh, the way it should be. And so you're never really going to get a sort of a root negative 13 squared showing up, right? It's always going to just be, you know, sort of either you know, it's just going to be some pair, you know, a comma b. Whereas when you've got this sort of uh, representation as a quotient of a polynomial ring, uh, you have to kind of manually reduce powers of alpha down using your, your polynomial. And we found this to be a bit tricky, um, especially when you want to explicitly do a lot of things like, you know, just evaluating explicitly a product of two, um, two elements, right? In this case, right, the quadratic field is kind of easy because you could kind of, you know, instruct a proof assistant to automatically simplify all of this away. But when you've got more general examples, it becomes harder and harder to kind of uh, write a nice set of simplifier rules that, that does a sort of calculation like this for you. Um, so what we did was we kind of, uh, yeah, prototyped a, a, a tactic, which we called times table tactic. Um, it's really unfortunate that we can't see this. I wonder if I can zoom out. Hey, okay. Um, and what this does is it, it kind of does calculations like this for you explicitly when you're in a ring that has a times table, right? So a ring like this is generated uh, over the integers uh, by, by two elements, you know, sort of as a, as a module. Uh, and so the multiplication map is some linear map. So you could just think of it as a matrix, right? Or a times table. We're just giving a definition for how to multiply the two generators with each other and, and to, by themselves. And so when you have a ring like this, um, whenever you see a sort of a product of uh, you know, the basis elements, uh, you kind of know what the answer should be and you can kind of substitute linear, linearly and uh, sort of simplify things that way. So we prototyped a tactic that uh, we hope will be sort of a more efficient way of doing this uh, in future. So here we can see we were joined actually the square root of two and the square root of three. So this is kind of in some, some ring that contains a square root of two and a square root of three with sort of what you would expect the, uh, the, the times table to be, right? So now we've got three, um, three generators, sorry, four generators as a module. We've got one, the square root of two, the square root of three, and a product of square root two by square root of three. And this is a sort of property you might want to, to check, right? This is really the norm of a general such element. Uh, and so I, maybe you can kind of imagine if you have some experience with, uh, with Lean that if you tried to do this just by kind of simplifying, things would blow up relatively quickly, right? Uh, you've got one, two, three, four terms and four uh, multiplication operations or three multiplication operations and things are just gonna get 
rather large. And then whenever you've got, you know, square root two times square root three times square root two again, you know, you're gonna have to somehow tell the simplifier to move the square root twos to the left, the square root threes to the right, and then to combine the square root twos, but then there's maybe some associativity going on. It seems like it might be kind of complicated to, to write sort of rules to simplify such a thing quickly. And um, I'll just note out that you, you're really using relations in the ring here. So this isn't just sort of a thing which is true in any ring by a sort of a ring tactic, because you're really going to be applying the, the fact that square root two times square root two is two, and square root three times square root three is three. Um, so you're not working in sort of a, you're not trying to prove a, something which is true sort of just by the ring operations, you're also using the, um, yeah, well, the quotient, right? Using the fact that you've got some, some relation between elements. So anyway, we, we wrote a version of a tactic that does this. It's just called times table and it works fairly well. I mean, I think it could still be improved a bit. It could still be made faster, um, but you can see here this, this goal now, which might be quite complicated to do otherwise, is really just you know apply something and then do times table. Um, so we hope that something like this, maybe not exactly this, but some kind of future, future version of it will be more useful uh, when doing proofs like this in the future. And that's because, you know, you have to do things like this all the time when doing this sort of proof, right? If you want to check that some ideal is generated by a single element, you have to express the original generators in terms of that element, uh, you know, multiplied by some, some, something else, and then you have to just check you know, do these two things really multiply together to give you this other thing? And you have to do that over and over again. Every time you want to prove that two ideal classes are equal, you have to exhibit some principal ideal that multiplies one to get to the other. And you have to check a bunch of, you know, does this thing really multiply by that to give you this thing? And sort of in a computer algebra system, these sort of things are just kind of done instantly. But when you really have to prove every step of the calculation, you really need, we believe, tactics like this to help you out. Saying that about computer algebra systems, though, this is another thing that has been considered before is, is how can you leverage computer algebra systems um, in proof systems? So there are many steps of this sort of proof that a computer algebra system would be able to sort of give you the answer. Um, so for example, generators of the class group and of the unit group, um, the computer algebra system could compute what those generators are. And uh, then using that knowledge, you might be able to simplify some of the proofs. For example, uh, when we're doing these um, proofs of non-principality, you might want to say, use a computer algebra system to sort of find a prime for which a uh, certain equation is insoluble, and then put that back into your um, proof assistant and use that uh, to inform the rest of your proof. And right now, of course, you can do this, but you can do this only by copy paste, right? You can open up in a different window your favorite computer algebra system, and you can type some commands, and then you can get some, you know, big long expressions. Maybe they're generators of some group, or maybe they're, uh, I don't know, some other some other thing. And you can copy paste them across and try and massage them until they they are something accepted by the proof assistant. Um, and we would like to make this sort of thing easier. We would like that there would be maybe a tactic which would sort of call the computer algebra system for you get the data from the computer address system in a way that the proof assistant understands and kind of try and validate what the computer address system did. So another example would be factorization. For example, you know, if you've got to factor uh, some ideal into a product of prime ideals, that's the sort of thing where a computer address system might be able to do that using a very sort of fast, unverified underlying code, perhaps one written in France. And then you would want to check that that thing really did work. So, in this case, we kind of prototype once again, another tactic, which is called replace certified sage equality, which is designed for this sort of factorization problem. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but it's sort of a general sort of template that you can kind of use uh, to kind of build tactics that sort of do things like go to sage, ask sage for a factorization, import the factorization back into lean, and then check that using some, some existing tool. So in this case, that might be a, a tactic like norm num. Once you've got a factorization, it's very easy to use norm num to check that you can actually multiply out the factors and get back what you wanted. Uh, and it's easy to ask Sage to factor an integer. And we would like not to have to do this by copy pasting. We're hoping to use tactics like this. I mean, it, it already works for these basic examples, but uh, we need to do a bit more. Uh, so yeah, we, we prototyped a, a sort of a computer algebra system 
link tactic, which has been considered many times before, uh, with Lean and Sage that we hope will be useful. So I think I'll stop there. I mean, I know we started a bit late, but I don't want to uh, infringe on anyone's uh, timing. So oh, thank you. <laughs>